Good morning, First Coleraine, and good morning to everyone who's joining us this fifth Sunday of broadcast services. And thank you to everyone who's taking part. Today we begin a new study in Peter's second letter, and we're going to call it Knowing and Growing. Let us worship God. Peter 2 verse 10. Once you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Just before lockdown, we had been studying 1 Peter together. Peter was writing from Rome and writing to a scattered church, and that was God's timing for us. Peter's second letter, he also writes from Rome. But by this time, it's possible that the Apostle Paul had already been martyred. Peter too is very aware that very soon he'll be giving up his life. And so he writes to the church again, and he wants to establish them. In the first chapter, he talks about knowing and growing in the Lord Jesus. In the second chapter, he talks about being wary of false teachers and their false teaching. And in the third chapter, he wants them to lift their eyes from their present trouble and focus their eyes on the life that is yet to be. Let's hear God's word. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the second letter of Peter, chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. Second Peter 1 1 to 11. This is the word of God. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so short-sighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hello everyone and welcome to prayer time. This morning, uh, before we actually go to prayer, I'd like to share with you a verse of scripture. It's a verse I came on during the week and I found in a great assurance that the Lord would always be with us. No matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, and there are no walls, there are no doors, uh, no virus that will keep him out. 
In other words, the lockdown will not in any way affect our relationship with him. The verse is found in John chapter 20 and it's verse 26. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Isn't that just a wonderful affirmation that as we go to prayer, the Lord is indeed with us and he will strengthen us no matter what lies ahead. This morning, I'd like that we would pray globally as against in particular for our own congregation. Let us pray. Lord of all the earth, in this moment of global pandemic, our horizons are suddenly expanded. Hard borders on the island of Ireland, trade borders in the Irish Sea, building bridges to Scotland. Lord, these things seem to lose their importance when politics is paralysed and retail has receded. All our insular red lines are increasingly fading to pink. Suddenly, we are interested in what's happening in Italy, keen to learn from the experiences of countries like China Impress upon us, Lord, in these days that we are really global disciples, part of a bigger church in your world. Lord, we are called to pray. We are called to love locally to those from whom we are spatially distanced and to pray with a passion for those from whom we are spatially distanced and will never meet. Lord, hear our prayer. For nations near and far, for people of every tribe and tongue, for the global effort to fight this virus, Lord, remind us that Jesus shall reign where'er the sun does his successive journeys run. His kingdom stretch from shore to shore till sun shall rise and set no more. Lord of all peoples, hear our prayer from this place for your word. In Jesus' precious name we pray. One day, Jesus taught by the lakeside. Lots of people gathered to hear him. The crowd became too large. What would Jesus do? Seeing a boat nearby, Jesus climbed aboard. Now he could see the people and they could see and hear him. Jesus began to tell parables, stories about ordinary things that taught people about God. A farmer scattered seed on his field. Jesus' story was like a picture with words instead of drawings. People could picture the farmer working. They'd seen it many times. Some of the scattered seed lay on a path. Whoosh, birds quickly swooped down to gobble it up. Some seed landed on stony parts of the field. They quickly grew into spindly, puny plants. The hot sun soon shriveled them up because they could not root in the shallow soil. Other seed had rooted among thorns. It didn't produce grain. The thorns crowded around the young plants, blocking out the needed sunshine and rain. The rest of the seed fell on good ground. As time passed, the shoots became healthy plants, bearing plenty of new grain. The farmer must have been very happy. At the end of the story, the disciples came to Jesus. Why do you teach in parables, they asked. 
Jesus said, parables help people understand about God if they really love him. People who don't love God can't understand parables. Jesus explained the parable. He said the seed is God's word. Seed on the path is like somebody hearing but not understanding God's word. Satan makes them forget what God said. Some people quickly receive God's word. They're like the seed on stony soil. But as soon as somebody mocks them or makes things difficult because they love God, a sad thing happens. These same people who joyfully started to follow Jesus turn away and stop obeying God's word. They don't want to pay the price of following God. How sad that they should want to please their friends rather than God. The thorns in the parable are like worldly worries and the love for money that fills some people's lives. They are so busy trying to get more money and more things that they leave God out of their lives. But the seed that fell on good soil and gave a good harvest is like the word of God entering hearts and changing people's lives. These people serve and honour God. The crowds didn't want to leave. Many wanted to follow God and please him. Jesus' parables helped them to understand how to obey God. This comes from Jill, a nurse in Causeway. In 35 years of nursing, I've never experienced anything like this. In work, on duty is almost the easy part. It's so busy I don't have time to consider how I'm feeling. Home is harder. I worry I'll bring it home to my family. I fear for my colleagues. It's almost impossible to clear your head. It's difficult not to be overwhelmed. Psalm 91 assures me I'm not facing this alone. Verse 4 says, He will cover you with his feathers and under his wing you will find refuge. This gives me strength and hope. Hello from Kathmandu to everybody in First Coleraine. Like you, I'm on lockdown here. For the last three weeks, uh, that has been the case. And in fact, yesterday that was just increased uh, by almost another two weeks. And the police are becoming more strict uh, about trying to enforce that. COVID-19 disease has not fully taken off in Nepal as yet, though sadly there are signs that it's about to. But what is already happening is that there is a wave of deep poverty sweeping the country because of the economic results of COVID-19 around the world. If you'd like to know more about that, uh, then look up my last prayer update. Uh, you can get it online uh, and you can read a little bit more about that. Thankfully, I'm keeping well uh, and busy working every day online, contacting colleagues here around the country and also working at preparing materials uh, that will be used once the lockdown finishes. You may also be aware uh, that Jane is back in Coleraine. Uh, her school, is the building is closed, though the new uh, teaching term began uh, on Easter Monday, believe it or not. So she needs to get up in Coleraine at 3am, get online and begin teaching children spread around Kathmandu and also one child in South Korea. Do please pray for us at this time. Uh, UMN is in the midst of an unfolding disaster in the country and struggling with financial uh, implications itself and with major and difficult decisions to be taken. Pray also just for our health and protection uh, while we're here. I continue to pray uh, for everyone in First Coleraine. And at this time, I pray that God will be your refuge and strength 
and you will discover he is an ever-present help in this really strange time of trouble. Thank you for your interest and your love. Thank you to so many who have been in touch with us uh, via social media in recent weeks. All of that is very, very much appreciated. May God be with all of you in these days. With the wonderful sunshine this week, most of us have been outside pottering about in the garden or the backyard. And we've discovered things that need to be cleaned or tidied up or maybe just recycled. In these last few weeks, with its various joys and challenges, things that we have believed and sang for years have been pushed into the light of reality. Help us now to live a life that's dependent on your grace. Keep my heart and guard my soul. O oh, great God of the highest heaven, occupy my lowly heart. Hold it all and reign supreme, conquer every rebel part. Let no Have loved and purchased me, make me yours forevermore. I was blinded by my sin, had no ears to hear your voice, did not know. No taste for heaven's joys. Then your spirit gave me life, opened up your word to me. Through the gospel of your Son, gave me endless hope and peace. Let's turn to Second Peter chapter 1, and we're going to look this morning at verses 1 to 11. As we do that, let's pray and ask God to help us. Heavenly Father, give us ears to hear, give us eyes to see, and give us hearts that will respond to your word this day. In Jesus' name, amen. A little interesting fact for you. The human hand can only grow in length to 11 inches. Any more than that, and it would be a foot. Most of us want to grow in our Christian lives, initially, anyway. But as time goes on, that desire can ebb and fade away. 
like the old farmer who used to say of his Christian walk, well, I'm not making much progress, but at least I'm established until the day that he got his tractor stuck in a muddy field right up to the axle. And a neighbor shouted across the field, well, you're not making much progress, but at least you're established. Maybe that's how you feel today, stuck. Your spiritual maturity has got nothing to do with your age. As regards the coronavirus, you might be in one of those age-vulnerable groups. But as regards your spiritual maturity, you might still be in nursery school. Or maybe you're saying this morning, I haven't a clue where I am spiritually. Well, good news. Peter, in his second letter, has some wise advice for growing in godliness. I find it fascinating that this is Peter the one who was known in the Gospels for his impetuous character, now teaching us about how to be deliberate and disciplined in our spiritual growth. That's how much he had been changed. And if Peter can change, and if Peter can grow, then so can you and I. And, Peter says, God has made it possible for you and I to grow in godliness because he's given us his power and he's given us his promises. Now, I could write you a check. I could promise to pay you a million pounds and you would take that check to the bank and they would just laugh at you because I don't have the resources to back that promise, that check up. But God has the resources to back all of his promises up. What we need to do is to cash in those promises. And that's something that we need to do. Peter tells us four things about growing in godliness. The first thing that Peter tells us might sound a bit basic. He says you must make sure that you have believed the promises. In verse 5 he says, for this very reason. For what reason? Well, the reasons that he's listed in verses 3 and 4, that you have believed in Jesus as Saviour and Lord. And when you have, then you've received everything that you need for life and for godliness. This is fundamental. If you want to grow spiritually, then you must have received new life from God through faith in Jesus Christ because it's the life of Christ in you that enables you to grow spiritually. The second thing Peter wants to tell us is again in that phrase, for this reason. He wants us to have the right motivation for growing in godliness. We don't want to grow in godliness because we want other people to look at us and say what a great Christian they are. We don't want to grow in godliness because we want to get on better in life or because we want God to bless our families. We want to grow in godliness because we've come to know Jesus as Saviour and Lord. We've experienced his grace and kindness. And because we have, we want to glorify and honour his name. Thirdly, Peter tells us, we need to make every effort to grow spiritually. Listen to that. Make every effort. I know some people sometimes say, let go and let God. And others say, now God's done his bit, now it's over to you to do your bit. But listen to what Paul says in Philippians. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So it's actually both God is at work, but you should be at work also. So tell me, how's that going? Are you making every effort? Mentally, do you make every effort? Do you think carefully about where you are spiritually and in what areas you have grown spiritually? Do you make every effort physically? Do you set time aside to read God's word, to read Christian books, to read theology, to seek out answers to questions that God's word raises for you? You won't grow spiritually if you aren't being deliberately active. But what areas do we need to focus on? 
Fourthly then, Peter gives us seven areas in which we should be making progress. God willing, on Wednesday evening, we'll take a little more time to look at these in detail. But these are obviously areas that the false teachers that Peter mentions in chapter 2 are lacking. The lack of these things in their lives identify them as false teachers. Peter says, you have the foundation of faith in Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord. Add to that, therefore, moral excellence, goodness. In that way, God will reveal his truth knowledge to you from his word as you study it. Add to that knowledge self-control. For what good is truth if you don't have the self-control to put it into practice? And what good would self-control be if you only did it once in a while or now and again? So add to self-control perseverance, that ability to keep going. Add to perseverance godliness, devotion to God, dependence upon him, worship him daily. And to that godliness, uh, work that out in brotherly kindness in relationship with others. And then Peter says, you will be able to love as God has loved you. These things aren't in chronological order, they're in logical order. In other words, it's not that you must complete one before you begin the next. You must have lots of knowledge before you begin self-control. They are all interrelated. The important thing to remember is that you must make every effort. It's like being on a diet program or a fitness program. You have to keep at it over the long haul in order to see results. The question is, are you making every effort? If we're not making any spiritual progress, then Peter says we are short-sighted. We've forgotten what it means to have experienced the grace and the forgiveness of God. We're not established. We're stuck. And he gives us great incentive to keep going and to keep growing. Here's what he writes. For if you do these things, you will never fall and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. He says we'll receive a welcome. In 1965, Robert Manray set off from Falmouth, Massachusetts, in his little vessel called Tinkerbell, just 13 and a half feet long. He was heading across the Atlantic to Falmouth and Cornwall. It took him 78 days of incredible effort. He was washed overboard. The rudder broke. He lost countless nights sleep because he was sailing through shipping lines. He was completely exhausted and he began to dream of a warm hotel room and a soft bed and a lovely meal. When the headland appeared on the horizon, he longed just to be out of that boat. But he could not believe the welcome he received. Soon the hotel room and the bed and the meal were forgotten as he was greeted by 300 boats. And as he came into the harbour, over 20,000 people had gathered to greet him and to welcome him. One day, one day all of the effort that we make will be worth it. For we will receive an even greater welcome home. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we remember Paul's prayer. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. You are the God who called us to life in Jesus and who is transforming us to be like Jesus. Such is your grace that we are called, cherished, changing and kept. As we seek to make more of Jesus, we trust you to make us more like Jesus. As your word tells us, you are faithful and you will do it. 
In Jesus' name, amen. May the grace of the Lord Christ Jesus and the love of the Father above and the presence and the power of the Spirit of God go with you now and forevermore. And the people of God said, Amen. Take